Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, ich wünsche Ihnen einen schönen guten Morgen äh, und begrüße Sie sehr herzlich zu unserem Pendel 3. Äh, wir haben vereinbart, dass wir mehrsprachig diesen Pendel abhalten. Ich werde dann später noch äh, auf Englisch umschalten. Ähm, es sind zwei Vorträge in Englisch, einer in Deutsch und wir werden beide Sprachen benutzen, korrekter gesagt österreichisches Deutsch und deutsches Deutsch. Und ich, 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 ich setze jetzt mal in, in Englisch fort, so um, I switch to English now and I would like to welcome all of you to our panel this morning. Uh, this panel will deal with colonial encounters, nature, race and the question of the body politic between colonialism and antisemitism. Uh, in other words, this deals from different perspectives with the construction of antisemitism in the framework of colonial theories, maybe colonial practices as well. So we are dealing with the formative impacts of colonial theories on antisemitism. And I think we have three very interesting presentations, uh, all concerned with Germany in the 19th as well as the 20th century. And it would of course be interesting at another opportunity to expand this to other countries as well. I'm thinking of France. I'm also thinking of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which as you know, Uh, did not so much have colonies on their own, but developed a full colonial mindset. So the, the issue of colonialism without colonies uh, is very relevant here. But I think this morning we refrain ourselves more or less to Germany and how colonialism impacted on the formation of antisemitism. From, a, from an organization point of view, I should mention that we have roughly 90 minutes time, a bit less, which is not too much. And we have agreed that uh, the presentations will take about 20, uh, 20 to 25 minutes each. And in the end, we will hopefully have some time left for questions and answers or comments, discussion. So, Having said that, it is my pleasure to introduce the first presenter to you, Professor Lukas Bormann, in the middle of the three presenters, uh, will speak about uh, from colonial periphery to the center of antisemitism, the impact of colonial studies on the antisemitic narratives of young academics in Germany. Professor Bormann um, is professor for New Testament at the Philips University in Marburg and is a specialist in uh, New Testament, obviously, and the history of ancient religions. His research also includes um, studies on Protestant mentality in the 20th century and uh, the views of scholars and clergy on both contemporary and contemporary and ancient Judaism. So I think this is a, a very interesting perspective from a theological point of view, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you and to give you the floor. Thank you very much for, to the organizers and to Professor Sauer um, for inviting me here to the conference. Um, The topic here is an, a Jewish, young Jewish lawyer who um, is experienced in colonial studies and he was quoted very often by Protestant theologians, but my topic is not today the Protestant theologians, but this uh, Jewish lawyer himself. From colonial periphery to the center of antisemitism, 
the impact of colonial studies on the anti-Semitic narratives of young academics in Germany. To give you an overview, this should be. Oh, okay. So first, anti-Semitism and colonial study in 19th and early 20th century Germany. The present contribution deals with the influence of the German Empire's colonial policies on the mindset and attitude of aspiring Christian, and that means Christian German, and Jewish intellectuals. The emergence of institutions for colonial research there's a good book from Ruppenthal, 2007. The history of the most important colonial actors, as well as a question of the relationship between colonial policy, politics and national socialist policies of living space, Lebensraum, and extermination have all been well researched by Ebner, Zimmerer. The effect of colonial activities on racial anti-Semitism and on the views of educated Jewish and Christian Germans, there is a book by our colleague Davis, very important, and I read it with uh, admiration. Um, and on the views of educated Jewish and Christian Germans have been occasionally discussed, but was seldom analyzed in depth. This paper will use as an example Friedrich Samuel Blach one of the very few Jewish officers of the Prussian army of the Great War and later on a successful business executive in order to study the intellectual and cultural influence of German colonialism and thus understand how colonial studies impacted the development of cultural narratives about Jews in Germany. to deal this, yes. Okay. Now, to start with the Protestant theologian, when in 1879 Wilhelm Marr was publishing his first anti-Semitic publications and the well-known Berlin anti-Semitism controversy was starting, also the first attempt to combine anti-Semitism and colonialism appeared. I'd like to name as a forefather of these ideas the professor for Christian mission, Karl Platt, who introduced the term race into scholarly debate of Protestant theology. Platt started, stated that the relation of Jews and Christian Germans has to be analyzed under the terms of, quote, psychology of nations on the life and dying of nation and also on the physiognomy of the whole, end of quote. Blatt was an early bird on using the term race, as well as the ideas from the field of colonialism in scholarly debate. His lecture in Berlin, 1880 and 81, was a great success. He himself pointed out that he had also many Jewish students in the audience. Now I skip and name only a few topics which are important. You have something like a crisis of anti-Semitism in 1910. There was an article in the Deutsche Staatsbürgerzeitung, is anti-Semitism still justified in an anti-Semitic journal? It was debated. Then you have a shift to this racial determinism. This author stated that um, the most problem of the, the anti-Semitistic uh, discourse is now internationalization and, quote, bastardization. We have a great impact of racial, racial ideas now. And in 1906 and 1908, the Institution for Colonial Studies in Germany were founded, the Handelshochschule in Berlin, 1906, and the Hamburg Colonial Institute in 1908. There were important research by Eugen Fischer into the problem of mixed races, and his famous book, Rehobot Bastards People, was also um, reviewed in uh, journals, not only in the scholarly world, but also in the public. 
In 1912 and 14, you have the dis debate about mixed marriages in the German Reichstag, and this all is a background for my topic. These ideas of race, particular in this radical form of de determinism, elicits problems in connected ideological systems, such as in the conviction that Christian faith, and particularly baptism, is not limited by the border of races. What can be the significance of conversion and mission, for instance, when not Christian belief, but an unchangeable and unchangeable entity called race has a conclusive impact on human development. That's a the theological problem of uh, racist theories. Besides see the religious and theological tensions, the determ deterministic biological race theory causes also tensions within the concept of an evolutionistic development of nations, which was also discussed in colonial studies. An important role on this evolutionistic approach played Georg Tilenius and Karl Ratken from the Hamburg Colonial Institute, who had the idea of valorization in Wertsetzung of indigenous people and even discussed the Europeanization, Europeisierung of the colonized nations. Now to Friedrich Lach. Friedrich Samuel Blach, 1884 to 1969. Um, this picture is from the Reichshandbuch der Deutschen Gesellschaft, 1929, and I always um, announce that the entry of the Adolf Hitler was more short than the entry of Friedrich Blach. He was more important for the Reichshandbuch der Deutschen Gesellschaft in these years. It is in this atmosphere determined by anthropological, cultural, theological, and legal discourses about race and racial mixture that the young Jewish academic Friedrich Blach grew up. Blach was proud of German colonial expansionism and learned that mixed populations were a topic of scholarly debate which had an impact on the social and cultural life of society. However, Blach was committed also to a different set of values, namely Jewish self-confidence for him not at last based on the economic and social success of German Jews since the mid of the 19th century. Between 1906 and 10, he also attended lectures in colonial studies in the newly founded Institution for Colonial Studies in Hamburg and Berlin. It seems quite probable that Blach considered a career as a state employee in the German colonies or the colonial administrations the latter was a part of the state service which provides career opportunity also to, quote from Davis' book, men designated as Jewish by their peers, end of quote. The main ambition of colonial studies was to train students to increase the economic value of the colonies and their populations, a process described by a key term of German colonial politics, valorization in Wertsetzung. This process of valorization was applied to natural resources as well as to the population. In the words of Ratgen, quote, especially the low cultural level of the native urges set off a fatherly caring government, end of quote. This caring government was grounded on the economic assumption, quote, the Negro is the most valuable asset for the economic outcome, end of quote. Therefore, the education to labor was seen as most important aim of the colonial training of the indigenous people. And you have a quote quite near from Dernburg about this idea to valorize the indigenous people. In behalf of this, the institutes employed some indigenous teachers in African and Asian languages, but in their daily life followed a strict separation between these individuals, their German colleagues and students. In the same way, the activities of the colonizers on the indigenous population to be valorized should be secured by a clear separation of the colonizers and the colonized, which was most often expressed through racial terms as, quote, strict separation of races, which also means strictly to avoid sexual relations as well as intermarriage. So it is no surprise to find that in 1909, 1909, the topic of the annual exam at the Hamburg Colonial, 
colonial institute was, quote, the bastards and the question of mixed marriage in Southwest Africa, clearly inspired by the research of Fischer. The lectures held at the German colonial institutes included more topics of racial studies, such as politics of race, separation of races, and mixture of races. Okay, jetzt habe ich. Gut, danke. Blach's book, The Jews in Germany, written by a Jewish German, was inspired by these ideas. The book examines a single central idea how the Jewish and Christian Germans might be merged into a single folk, the Germans, a goal which the author calls a utopia. Blach underlines the importance of this aim by the needs of the German nation state to reach an international recognized position. Germany has to create the unity of the nation in all respects as a most important precondition of its ability to reach the, quote, first row of the great nations. The book is divided into two main parts discussing the behavior of the Jews and the behavior of the Christian majority. However, both parts are structured on the basis of the main assumption of the concepts of valorization by caring government disciplining on the one side and education and training on the other. In the first part, Blach gives an overview of the participation of the Jews in economy, described as mostly traders, very successful, intelligent, always looking to profit. In politics, construed as mostly liberal, even communist, with only a few conservative nationalistic Jews, something which Blach deplores. In culture and also in social life, Jews are important. The author paints the Jews with characteristic deemed negative from a conservative and nationalistic point of view and, as he suggested, should thus be changed as quickly as possible. The 21st century reader will recognize the most well-known anti-Semitic stereotypes in this section of the book. He claims that every Jew has to work hard to improve his, quote, good Jewish characteristics, which are, according to Blach, quote, sobriety, sense of family, hard work, energy, efficiency. These qualities should be used by German Jews for the good of his fellow Germans, but not in service of such movements as communism and Zionism. Blach argues that every Jew should fight against the bad characteristics offensive to Germans, such as speaking with a Yiddish accent, some peculiarities of communication or loyalty to non-German, especially Eastern European Jews. This fight has to be fought by every Jew with strict self-discipline and hard self-training. Blach proposes assimilation as the only way for German Jews to be fully part of the German community. Some might choose baptism, he suggests, but the majority of Jews will never accept Christianity and thus mixed marriages will be the most convenient way for German Jews to become integrated in German society, according to Blach. The author also states, quote, the Zionists call assimilation suicide, but Blach insists um, he will, it will be a, quote, free, joyful suicide. Blach emphasizes that every Jew has to educate and train himself in a very strong and disciplined manner, straffe Selbsterziehung. Please. The second part, the self-education of the Jews should be accompanied by efforts of the Christian majority to educate and train the minority, the German Jews. This is a topic of the second section, the behavior of the Christian majority, which is most of all a duty to educate and train the Jewish minority. Erziehungspflicht. Blach discusses proposals for the behavior of the Christian majority which should accept Jews in all assemblies, groups, and informal communities. And he also mentioned Freemasons. And I uh, had a look because we have this discussion about Freemasons. And Blach deplores that even the Prussian Freemasons did not anymore accept Jews, which was for me quite surprising because mostly Freemasons accepted Jews, but in Prussian they did not, um, to Blach. 
Um, the author asks Germans to educate the Jews to be good Germans while acknowledging the racial barriers which he identifies between Jews and Germans. Considering these, he proposes mixed marriage to overcome the barriers between Jewishness and Germanness and suggests that Jews should seek to marry Germans. Such intermarriage is necessary in order to reach the utopia of a German society in which German Jews view themselves and behave not primarily as Jews, but as Germans. Nationalist, proud, truthful, strong, intelligent, altruistic, brave, always to profit not themselves, but Germany. That's the idea of Blach. Thus, the Jewish and the German race, the text demands, must be mixed to reach a Jewry which will become more and more Germans in terms of racial criteria. For Blach, it was very important that the children produced by these mixed marriages remain Jewish because they would be both Jews in a full sense and also more German than the Jewish part of their parents. The final result was conceived of as a German Jewry which could not be distinguished by racial categories from German Christianity or Germans as such and will contribute extensively to the positive outcome of Germany. In Blach's own words, quote, the dissolving of the Jews into Germanhood is the ultimate goal, end of quote. The debate about Blach's book. The book was broadly received and very hotly debated in the Berlin Jewish community. A lecture was given about the book and the topic of mixed marriages. However, it seems that the Jewish community of Berlin planned to have this debate as an internal matter. The first printed review is found in the moderately anti-Semitic Staatsbürgerzeitung, December 1910. The author, Hartmut Stegemann, published three lengthy articles on the book which, appreci which appreciated the anti-Jewish stereotype presented by Blach, but concluded that Blach did not want to turn Jews into Germans, but Germans into Jews. Stegemann came to the resolute anti-Semitic conclusion, quote, we know better and differently the Jewish nation is and must continue their separate existence, end of quote. The radical anti-Semitic publication, Semi Kirchner had the same opinion in some other uh, language. After this, although Jewish journals from different Jewish factions engaged in the public debate, writing from a Zionist perspective, Bruno Blau pointed to the, quote, typically anti-Semitic jargon of the Book of Blach, and considered the book an attempt to show the inferiority of Jewishness. The Zionist weekly, Jüdische Rundschau, insisted that Jews and Germans were deeply disconnected and their cultures were based on totally different racial conditions. The author claimed that Blach underestimated the, quote, tenacity and vitality of the also historical important Jewish race, end of quote. Blach's ideas would lead to the destruction of the Jewish race. The author himself states that the only real solution for the Jewish question and, quote, only honorable way is Zionism. Fritz Baum in the Journal of Students Association of German of Jewish Belief criticized Blach for his lack of familiarity with Jewish history and rejected it, his ideas from a more conservative non-Zionist point of view. For Baum, Blach is not, as he states, a joyful suicide, but a self-executioner. The most prominent review was published as a lead article in the most important mainstream Jewish monthly, Allgemeine Zeitung für das Judentum. The author of this review was Ludwig Geiger, quite important figure. The well-known scholar and co-head of the Assembly of German State Citizens with, with Jewish Confession, Geiger noted that the author had been totally unknown before, and that the Staatsbürgerzeitung, as well as some Jewish papers, had reviews of the book. Geiger accepted some of Blach's proposals, especially improvement of the behavior of those who were perceived as too, quote, Jewish, which means for Geiger, quote, all the shortcomings which we adhere in movement, gesture, language, and attitude, end of quote. However, Geiger strongly rejects Blach's main idea of merging German and Jewish Germans through intermarriage. In Geiger's view, Blach's utopia would exterminate the culture of the German Jewry in its entirety. In Geiger's view, the goal, quote, to be fully German would be achieved by, quote, 
constant restless work on ourselves and by the sense of justice of our non-Jewish countrymen and compatriots. The reviews were mostly critical, but illustrate that Blach's booklet drew attention to a major issue of the self-understanding of German-Jewish relations in this time and German Jewry itself. Most German Jews loved their country, German culture, German ideals, the language, and even the German way of life. Most of them were also proud to be German Jews and did not want to convert to Christianity. Leading Jews, as Geiger, also rejected the assumption of Zionism as well as anti-Semitism. The Jews were a, quote, nation of its own and were not able to be Germans. Some modern scholars denote the views of the small group of German Jews who shared the views of Blach as only Germans, German nationalistic Jews who wanted to be German without becoming Christians, and thus reduce Jewishness to a religious denomination without social, political, and ethnic meaning. Some followed Blach's ideas and founded the National German Jews Movement led by Max Naumann, which claimed about 2% of the Jewish voters in Berlin. Conclusion. Blach was influenced by colonial studies in Hamburg and Berlin, which included the concept of valorization of a colonized population as well as debates about the outcome of mixed population, mixed marriages, and racial mixture. He adjusted this concept to the relationship between the Jewish minority and the Christian majority in Germany. The valorization of the Jewish minority should be reached by two activities, self-education and self-training of Jews, as well as training and education of the Jews by the Christian majority to make the Jews more German and to increase the value of the German Jews for the German nation as such. The valorization of the colonized population was in German colonial studies based also on a strict separation of races, but Blach turns the dispute about mixed marriage upside down and proposes intermarriage as a solution. Blach realized that the racial discourse of his time had a great impact on the views of different groups of the population. Not only anti-Semites and Zionists insisted that race is something valuable and important, but also great parts of the society accepted the idea of a racial determination of human beings. Therefore, Blach was forced, or failed to be forced, to discard this racial component and followed the idea of the anthropology of his times, that the only way to change racial determination is racial mixture. He also introduced the process of disciplining and training and adapted it to the situation of self-confident German Jews, mostly as self-discipline and self-training. In this proposal, Blach largely ignores Jewish tradition, culture, and religion. Um, from Blach is a quote, every reasonable human being celebrates Sabbath on Sunday. That was the thinking of, of Blach about Jewish uh, culture. He was convinced that the economic needs of a modern society will dominate the lives and self-understanding of the population. The reviews by Jewish and non-Jewish authors demonstrates clearly the great impact of colonial studies for implementing racial theories on the public discourse about the Jews in Germany. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bormann, for your interesting um, presentation and also for meeting precisely the timeline. <laughs> um, I think we, there's a, a lot of interesting topics uh, to be explored further, and we can do that at the end in the, in the discussion and questions and answer session. Our next speaker will be uh, Christian S. Davis, Associate Professor of History at James Madison University. Professor Davis, um, researches, among other topics, on the intersection of colonialism and modern antisemitism in Germany. He has written a, a number of books on that topic. Uh, some of them have already been mentioned. And uh, Professor Davis also 
conducts a course on Austrian history and culture for American students each summer in Vienna. That is highly appreciated. So you have the floor. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, European discourses about Jews have long identified Jews with others outside of Europe's borders. Jews have been commonly depicted as Orientals, linked in European Christian thought with Muslims and Arabs since the Middle Ages. Conversely, the ascription of Jewishness to foreign populations dates back to at least the 15th century, encouraged in large part by the myth of the lost tribes of Israel, which led early modern explorers to speculate on the Jewish origins of newly discovered people. By the late 19th century, the forces of globalization, which both multiplied and intensified the webs of connectivity, linking Germany to the rest of the world, gave added impetus to the conflation of Jews and non-Europeans. In Germany, this phenomenon was not limited to the organized anti-Semitic movement that emerged in the 1870s, but movement members in Germany played a leading role in lending the vocabulary of anti-Semitism to discussions of foreign others. In the anti-Semitic press especially, anti-Semitism itself became a frame of reference for thinking about various non-white groups outside Germany's European boundaries. <clears throat> From blacks in the American South to the Chinese on the Shandong Peninsula to Arabs and blacks in German Africa, anti-Semites discussed non-white groups in anti-Semitic terms during this time which coincided with the era of the new imperialism, and they did so often as a way to illuminate the dangers posed by foreign peoples. At the same time, anti-Semites occasionally positioned Jews as the domestic counterparts of non-European populations under white control, and in so doing, anti-Semites argued for the applicability at home of racial lessons learned abroad about the governing of non-whites. By comparing Jews to non-whites, German anti-Semites also advanced an unmistakable argument for the Jews' racial otherness. This was part and parcel of a broader process of the racialization of the Jewish question. In Germany, begun in the 1870s through the writings of anti-Semitic ideologues like Wilhelm Marr. The situation in the American South drew the attention of German anti-Semites in the late 19th century. The argument that black emancipation in the United States and Jewish emancipation had similar negative consequences surfaced repeatedly in the anti-Semitic press, with authors comparing American blacks to German Jews and emphasizing the supposed similarities of each group's relation to the dominant white Gentile majority. The anti-Semitic German Social Party did this in its party newspaper in 1891 when it printed a report on the travel essays of the German playwright and publisher Paul Lindau. The Deutsche Soziale Blätter remarked that Lindau's description of the Negro question, his words, in Louisiana, closely resembled the Jewish question in Germany. And to press the point home, the paper replaced the words Negroes with Jews and whites with Germans in an excerpt from Lindau's writings. Quote, in general, the Jews do not appear able to surpass a certain level of development and haven't achieved anything distinguished in scholarship and industry, the revised excerpt ran. It continued, all Germans, regardless of party differences, share in the opinion that to allow the Jews the free exercise of their constitutional rights is completely impossible, since that would mean, in truth, making laziness and a lack of education the mistress of intelligence and industry. With knowledge of this undeniable truth, it would now be the easiest and most natural thing to do to put an end to this unhealthy state of affairs and replace the questionable paragraph concerning equal rights with one that agrees with and is more truthful to the situation." End quote. The Bletter concluded that altering Lindau's original text in this way transformed it into, quote, an accurate picture of how it appears in our Germany, and also the means for how it can become better, end quote. From this point of view, the catastrophe of black manumission in the United States 
paralleled that of Jewish emancipation in Germany. And by comparing the two, the Deutsch Soziale Blätter highlighted the logic and the necessity of emancipation's revocation. German anti-Semites drew additional lessons from the American South. One was the need to emulate the supposedly scientific and objective American approach to studying racial matters. The Deutsch Soziale Blätter made this argument in 1902 when it reported on lectures at the American Academy for Political and Social Science about souring relations between blacks and whites. As in 1891, the Blätter likened the situation in the United States to the situation in Germany, arguing that, quote, we European peoples could learn much from these lectures if we were to apply them comparatively to our own countries, for example, to the Jewish race in relationship to the German one, end quote. The paper pleaded for a German Michael to consider racial questions in a similarly, quote, sober and unbiased way, unquote. But the Blätter drew a rather different lesson the following year regarding the American approach to racial matters that it wanted Germans to follow, reporting on an increase in what it called racial degeneration in Germany through German-Jewish miscegenation the newspaper noted that, quote, in America, Judge Lynch officiates mostly in those cases where Negroes have raped white girls, end quote. Continuing the quotation, we wish, the paper concluded, that this racial instinct would take its place also in the German Reich, naturally in proportional and legal forms, since the Jew stands much further from the Germanic race than does the Negro to the white one, end quote. For the Deutsch Soziale Blätter, then, the killing of American blacks for the crime of racial defilement pointed the way forward for Germans concerned with Jewish-Gentile intermixing. Lessons in racial control learned in America might apply to the German homeland, albeit tamed by German law. By the mid-1880s, German anti-Semites, of course, also had the example of Germany's own colonial system before them following the extension of government protection in 1884 to German commercial interests in West Africa. The major anti-Semitic political parties of the day all endorsed the idea of colonial empire, as did most of the independent anti-Semitic press, motivated in part by the belief that colonies would give Germany significant economic and geopolitical advantages in the international competition of nations. Many anti-Semites embraced colonialism as well because the creation and maintenance of racial states abroad resonated with their own racialist worldview as an increasing number of anti-Semites identified Jews as members of a race and not a religion, not just a religion. Support for colonialism coexisted, however, with racial anxieties stoked by the reality of Germany's intensified contact with the non-European world and anti-Semitic observers frequently commented on alleged dangers posed to Germans and their interests by the increased exposure to non-Europeans that came with colonial empire. As in the case of the American South, anti-Semitism itself proved a useful framework for anti-Semitic observers when discussing colonial others, as these anti-Semites frequently drew parallels between Jews and the empire's various colonial subjects. The activities of Arab slave raiders in Eastern and Central Africa received significant attention in the anti-Semitic press early on. Anti-Semites were quick to allege strong similarities between nomadic Islamic slavers who raided settled black populations and Jews attributing both with a similar culture-destroying essence. Uh, the Kassel-based periodical Reichsgeld Monopol uh, Antisemitisches Volksblatt made this point explicitly in late 1888 in an article titled Semitic Barbarism in Africa. Here, the author used the familiar trope of the culture-destroying Jew to illustrate the particular danger slaving Arabs posed to the German civilizing mission in black Africa. Quote, as in Europe, the contributor wrote, where it is the Jew's quill that bears the moral poison into the masses of the people through the Jewish controlled press that undermines throne and altar 
and that threatens to destroy Christian Aryan civilization, so rage the despicably profit-oriented and trading Arabs with fire and sword against the people of inner Africa and who disallow the development of a better culture, end quote. The article classified the Arab as the Jew's cousin and labeled the battle against Arabic influences in Africa as, quote, anti-Semitic in the truest sense of the word, end quote. Anti-Semites use the Jewish example to illuminate the alleged danger posed by Chinese as well. In a two-part article titled Jews and Chinese that appeared uh, shortly before the incorporation of the Bay of Kiachau into the German Empire in 1897, the Deutsche Soziale Blätter marshaled the Jewish example to convince readers that the, of the threat Germany would face through the importation of Chinese agricultural workers into Prussia, opening with an insistence that the Chinese, quote, are coming closer to us daily through the acquisition of Kiachau, end quote. The author prefaced his observations about Jewish, uh, Chinese mercantile activity in the Dutch East Indies with the allegation that Jews had succeeded in destroying Germany's, quote, social and state institutions, unquote. He attributed the Chinese and the Jews with great similarities in character, namely a love of money and a haggling spirit. And he warned that, quote, what such a small people as the Jews have succeeded to do will surely not be difficult for the Chinese people to do also, end quote, should they be allowed into Germany. The author pleaded that a future Reichstag undertaking the repeal of Jewish emancipation would, quote, at the same time, extend the prohibition against the immigration of Jews equally to the Chinese, end quote. If colonized groups could be likened to Jews to highlight the dangers certain non-Europeans pose to Germany and its interests, and to whites more generally, Jews could also be likened to colonized peoples to drive home the supposed reality of the Jewish threat and of Jewish racial otherness. During the early years of empire, when Arabic slaving activity in Africa received significant attention back in Germany, anti-Semites compared European Jews to Arabs. The familiar accusation that Jews dominated the sex trade of Gentile women in Europe elicited such comparisons. In the summer of 1892, a speaker at the meeting of the German Society of Berlin-Westen on Jewish white slavery argued that, quote, the Jews in the Middle Ages played the role that Arabs do now in Africa, end quote. The example of Arab slave trading was also used to highlight the supposed enslavement by Jews of the German people as a whole. Adolf Stoiker, the leader of the anti-Semitic uh, Christian Social Party, made this point in 1898 while speaking in Berlin at the Commercium of the Society of German Students. Quote, all parties are united in one point concerning colonial policy, uh, Stoiker declared that we must put a stop to those rapacious hordes in Africa, to those Arabs who, he noted uh, to laughter from the audience, are also Semites, who in order to haul off one slave kill 10 others, who destroy and scorch everything. But this indeed brings to mind what some have said, he continued, that slavery reigns at home also that there are Semites and nomads here who destroy our property in order to enrich themselves, end quote. After vigorous applause from his listeners, he concluded that, quote, a powerful colonial policy could also be pursued here with a governor and also with a Schutztruppe. Perhaps we will experience it yet, unquote. In this way, Stoiker went beyond simply comparing Jews to colonized others to suggesting, with irony, the need to treat Jews like colonial subjects. In the second half of the empire, anti-Semitic observers of the German colonies increasingly linked Jews to Germany's black African colonial subjects. By this time, a hierarchical view of humankind that placed blacks at the lowest level of humanity enjoyed wide currency in Germany, even among critics of colonialism. 
the outbreak of the violent Herero and Nama uprisings in German Southwest Africa in 1904 stimulated an additional radicalization of images of blacks, spurred in part by the circulation of stories about the mutilation of captured German soldiers and white settler women by the rebelling Herero. Ascriptions of a radical otherness to blacks combined with attributions of a malicious essence to produce in some quarters, like in soldiers' memoirs, an anti-black rhetoric matched that matched or even surpassed the harshest invectives against colonized peoples, other colonized peoples, including Arabs. In this context, likening Jews to colonial blacks assumed a heightened significance, serving to highlight the Jews' racial otherness. Following the outbreak of the Herrera uprising, anti-Semites also likened Jews to black Africans to argue for the appropriateness at home of colonial-like practices. In so doing, they echoed the arguments of previous decades that advocated for the adoption towards Jews of methods of racial control used against blacks in the American South. The anti-Semitic press used the Herrera War to this effect repeatedly during the first years of fighting. In 1904, an article defending the reality and importance of racial differences that linked Jews to the rebelling Herero appeared in the Deutsche Welt. In quote, indeed, they are also men, the author wrote, speaking of both Jews and Hereros, but that a Jew will become a true German patriot and one of the Hereros, a professor of ethnology, in the not too distant future is in the end surely to be rejected despite the declared insignificant difference in the mental developmental capabilities of the human races, unquote. In September of 1904, the Deutsche Soziale Blätter published a lengthy front page article that implied a need for the application against Jews at home of the same brutal methods used against the rebelling Herero in German Southwest Africa, responding to a reader's insistence that Christian neighborly love should be applied to the Herero people the paper's editor classified the application of Christian love towards non-Germans as a type of religious fanaticism. The editor stated that the call to Christianity only served to weaken the German people, quote, be it vis-a-vis -vis Oriental or African blacks, unquote. By using the term Oriental blacks, the editor conflated Jews with black Africans and intimated the need for a retaliation against both that would be unrestrained by Christian values. Above all, anti-Semites in the last decade of empire used the example of black Africans to legitimize their concerns about intermarriage between Jews and Gentiles. The anti-Semitic press did this as early as 1904, but returned to the issue in a dramatic fashion in 1912, spurred by a debate that year in parliament over the legality of colonial anti-miscegenation policies. The parliamentary debate was sparked by the extension of prohibitions against race mixing in German Africa to the island colony of Samoa, but in the Reichstag, in the colonial press, and in anti-Semitic newspapers, proponents of the ban all focused on the danger posed by interracial mixing between whites and blacks, reflecting the near consensus at the time concerning the radical otherness of black Africans. The fact that a majority in parliament voted against prohibi uh, prohibiting interracial marriages in the colonies, voted against it, elicited bitterness, anger, and a degree of despair from the anti-Semitic press. Anti-Semitic observers saw the vote as a repudiation of the racialist worldview, and their response was to link Jews and black Africans more closely than ever before in the rhetoric. One piece in the Deutsche Soziale Blätter, shortly after the Reichstag vote, identified Jews as part black due to centuries of race mixing where, quote, Semitic Negroid components combined with Turanian Mongolian blood, unquote. Months later, another contributor lamented the general lack of racial consciousness in Europe and faulted race mixing with Jews at home and with blacks in the colonies. Were Europeans more racially conscious, the author declared, then, quote, miscegenation with Negroes in Africa would never have been allowed to come into question, but also in Germany, any marriages between Germans and Jews would have been precluded, unquote. 
The author concluded by recounting his encounter with two Jews and a, quote, Germanic family, unquote, while traveling from Prussia to Finland. Quote, Semites with Negroed infusions and pure-blooded representatives of the white race, he wrote. There is no reconciliation between the two, just as little as among black and white and yellow, unquote. Uh, the merging of representations of Jews and non-Europeans in the European imagination, uh, as I stated at the beginning of this paper, uh, certainly predated the rise of the new imperialism and the founding of the modern anti-Semitic movement in Germany in the late 19th century. Uh, but as this paper has argued, German anti-Semites put this long-standing tradition to new use during the time of the Kaiserreich, using anti-Semitism as a framework for thinking about Germany's new colonial subjects and other foreign groups, while also looking to contemporary examples of non-whites under white control in the colonies and in the American South in order to draw lessons about racial differences and racial domination that might be applied at home to Jews. This was part of a broader process of the globalization of the German Reich that took, part, uh, that took place around the turn of the century. Thank you very much. Also, thank you very much, Professor Davis, for your um, interesting and thought-provoking presentation. It's also ample ground for debate, I think. And with your permission, I would like to switch back to Austrian German now in order to introduce our third uh, speaker. Ich darf uh, vorstellen, Kollegen Tim Ebner, unseren dritten um, uh, Redner, uh, Vortragenden uh, in diesem Pendel. Uh, Kollege Ebner studierte an der Freien Universität Berlin Literaturwissenschaft, neuere Geschichte und Philosophie und hat in Erfurt im Fach Literaturwissenschaft promoviert und er ist jetzt Junior Fellow am Wiener Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies. Sein Thema ist, führt uns ein bisschen mehr ins 20. Jahrhundert, also in die Zeit des Nationalsozialismus, gegen Kolonisation und Weltverschwörung, Aufstandsbekämpfung in der nationalsozialistischen Kolonialliteratur. Persönlich finde ich ein sehr interessantes und aktuelles Thema. Nationalsozialismus und Kolonialpolitik ist ein großes Thema in der, in der Geschichtswissenschaft heute. Und eine literaturgeschichtliche Perspektive, glaube ich, ist mehr als willkommen. Bitte schön. Thanks a lot for this very nice introduction. Thanks a lot for your presentations, which I found really exciting, and, um, ah, okay. <laughs> sorry. And um, thanks a lot for the organizers of this uh, very inspiring conference, and I also want to take up on the occasion to uh, thank the Wiesenthal Institute for granting me a fellowship, um, which impossibles um, me to stay here in, in Vienna and um, take part in all these inspiring discussions at the Institute. Uh, I think this conference has been so far very uh, representative of those discussions. Um, yeah. Uh, I will now switch to German and I'll try to speak uh, slowly so that um, even non-native speakers can understand me, hopefully. Ähm, ja, Sie haben vielleicht gesehen, dass ich mein Thema noch mal geändert habe. Äh, ich wollte ursprünglich auch was zum Kaiserreich machen, aber dann dachte ich mir, wir haben da ähm, Experten hier, die da äh, besser Bescheid wissen und außerdem habe ich mein, äh, meine Doktorarbeit, ähm, mein Thema noch nicht in Wien vorgestellt, deshalb dachte ich mir, es ist doch sinnvoll, das mal zu machen. Ähm, ja, unter dem Begriff Gegenkolonisation können Sie sich wahrscheinlich nichts vorstellen. Das ist ein äh, zeitgenössischer Begriff, der äh, die Idee beschreibt, dass äh, Kolonisierte sich verschwören, um nun Europa ihrerseits zu kolonisieren, also die äh, koloniale Herrschaft äh, quasi umdrehen wollen. Und ich habe den Begriff jetzt verwendet, um sozusagen 
den kolonialrassistischen Diskurs gegenüberzustellen, dem antisemitischen, welcher im Titel jetzt mit Weltverschwörung bezeichnet wäre. Und ähm, ja, das, was mich interessiert und ich denke, was, ähm, was wichtig ist, um zu beschreiben, ähm, wie da Interferenzen und Zusammenhänge zwischen Kolonialrassismus und Antisemitismus zustande gekommen sind, ist die Perspektive der Aufstandsbekämpfung oder sowas, was man auch als Paranoia-Thema bezeichnen könnte, also diese, diese Weltverschwörungstheorien. Ja, und wie Sie schon gehört haben, man... Meine, mein Material ist die nationalsozialistische Kolonialliteratur, vielleicht erstmal allgemein zur äh, Kolonialliteratur, ähm, die war im Nationalsozialismus sehr wichtig ähm, und ähm, man kann davon ausgehen, dass äh, vielleicht die Hälfte der, der deutschen Kolonialliteratur in der äh, Phase der nationalsozialistischen Herrschaft erschienen ist. Das ist so ein bisschen paradox, man hat in der, in der relativ kurzen Zeit der Phase der deutschen äh, Kolonialherrschaft ähm, bis 1919, als nach dem Ersten Weltkrieg äh, im Versailler Vertrag die deutschen Kolonien verloren gegangen sind, hat man nicht so viel Kolonialliteratur, da gibt es eher so äh, Reiseberichte, die natürlich sehr stilprägend sind für das, was danach kommt, aber das, der Großteil an Kolonialliteratur und auch Kolonialfilmen, äh, also Filmen natürlich sowieso, ähm, aber ähm, ist einfach in, äh, in der Phase des Kolonialismus ohne Kolonien erschienen, also in postkolonialer Zeit. Ähm, ja, und ähm, Herr Sauer hat ja schon gesagt, äh, dass es diese Diskussion in der deutschen Geschichtswissenschaft gibt, jetzt wieder verstärkt seit ähm, dem 100-jährigen Jubiläum des Herero-Aufstands in äh, Deutsch-Südwestafrika. Ähm, meine Fragestellung und mein, meine Doktorarbeit ist natürlich auch, äh, beschäftigt sich auch mit dieser Frage, inwieweit man äh, Kontinuitäten findet von der Kolonialherrschaft äh, oder vom deutschen Kolonialismus hin zum Nationalsozialismus. Und ähm, man kann das natürlich nicht auf allen Ebenen sagen, aber in der Kolonialliteratur ist es auf jeden Fall so, dass es viele Kontinuitäten gibt, ähm, anders als jetzt auf politischer Ebene. So, jetzt erstmal kurz ein bisschen Bleiwüste, gleich gibt es wieder Bilder. Meine Grundthese ist also, dass die nationalsozialistische Propaganda dem Muster der Aufstandsbekämpfung folgt. Bürgerkriege und Kolonialkriege jetzt in der Geschichte waren immer ziemlich brutal und ich denke, dass das damit zusammenhängt, dass in diesen Kriegen der Feind oder der Gegner sozusagen unsichtbar wird. Also es gibt diese typische Dynamik in asymmetrischen Kriegen, dass eben äh, der Gegner ähm, äh, schwer unterscheidbar wird von der Bevölkerung und äh, die ähm, Kolonialherrscher dann eben dazu übergehen, äh, deshalb auch immer stärker die Bevölkerung äh, äh, zu bekämpfen und äh, deshalb hat man in diesen Kriegen die Dynamik, äh, eine Dynamik, die, die ziemlich brutal ist ähm, und diese diese Perspektive der Aufstandsbekämpfung hat die nationalsozialistische Propaganda für sich entdeckt, um sozusagen ein realistisches Szenario zu entwerfen, von dem ausgehend man ähm, die ultimative ideologische Mobilisierung erreichen konnte. Deshalb findet man immer dieses Moment in der NS-Propaganda, dass eben äh, der Gegner als äh, Verräter dargestellt wird, als innerer Feind, der seine Identität verbirgt und ähm, äh, dann aus diesem Verborgenen heraus den Aufstand äh, machen will, ähm, weil das natürlich ein Ultimum an Fiktionalisierung des Feindes erlaubt. Ähm, also wenn, wenn der äh, Gegner geheim ist, dann kann man ihn sich so entwerfen, wie man ihn gerade braucht und ähm, das ist dann auch das, was äh, die nationalsozialistische Propaganda macht. Gleichzeitig ähm, ist das auch ein Weg gewesen, äh, Propaganda ähm, zu popularisieren, weil man hat in der, ähm, in der Populärkultur immer auch dieses, äh, also bis heute, äh, ich weiß nicht, wenn Sie den neuen James Bond gesehen haben, dann ist Ihnen das vielleicht auch aufgefallen, dass es da auch diese Verschwörungstheorie-Elemente gibt, äh, dass Christoph Walz eben äh, diese Organisation als geheimer Drahtzieher im Hintergrund vorsteht, ähm, der mit den langen Fang Fangarmen der Tentakel, also das Zeichen von dieser Organisation ist ein Oktopus, was übrigens auch im, in der nationalsozialistischen Propaganda gerne auftaucht, ähm, 
die langen Fangarme, die sickern überall ein und äh, sickern durch die Netzwerke der Gesellschaft und äh, steuern dadurch alles durch so eine paranoische Fernsteuerung. Und diese, ähm, das ist was, was man kontinuierlich in, in der Populärkultur ähm, äh, moderner Staaten findet, was schlicht und ergreifend einfach damit zusammenhängt, dass ähm, die modernen Gesellschaften auf Öffentlichkeit aufbauen und sobald man Öffentlichkeit hat, also so eine sozusagen politische Bühne, wo man ähm, äh, eine, äh, politische Akte performen muss, hat man natürlich gleichzeitig immer diese, diese äh, Hintergründe, von denen aus dann ähm, äh, Einflussnahmen lanciert werden, und ähm, äh, das ermöglicht natürlich viele Spekulationen über, die, ähm, über, die, über das Off sozusagen der politischen Bühne, über das hinter den Kulissen. Und das ist was, was die Populärkultur einfach immer angeregt hat und natürlich heute nicht weniger. Ähm, Im Internet gibt es natürlich auch äh, diese Verschwörungstheorien. Ähm, nur damit es mich nicht falsch verstehen, ich möchte jetzt nicht sagen, dass das alles per se antisemitisch ist, aber ähm, für die Nazis ähm, war und ist das, äh, also auch für Neonazis ist das natürlich interessant, ähm, solche Sachen aufzugreifen, weil äh, das Populärkultur ist und dann nicht nur Propaganda sozusagen, sondern auch eine Propaganda, die so einen gewissen Unterwalt äh, Unterhaltungswert hat und dadurch wirksamer ist. Kurz zum Aufbau des Vortrags. Ich möchte im ersten Teil so ein paar allgemeine Features der Perspektive der Aufstandsbekämpfung vorstellen und möchte dann im zweiten Teil einen Spezialdiskurs darlegen über eine afrikanische Weltverschwörung, eine Gegenkolonisation, die auch einen gewissen, dieser Diskurs hat auch einen gewissen Österreich-Bezug. Allgemein ist es natürlich schon so, dass ich mich weniger mit Österreich auskenne und mehr mit der deutschen Situation die, was durchaus nicht immer übertragbar ist. Ähm, ja, das möchte ich hier darlegen, auch wenn es schon wirklich ein Spezialdiskurs, also in gewisser Weise auch ein marginaler Diskurs ist, ähm, aber der ist auch deshalb weniger bekannter und, glaube ich, eine interessantere Diskussionsgrundlage. Und im dritten Teil möchte ich dann diesen Spezialdiskurs äh, kontextualisieren, indem ich darstelle, wie es im Allgemeinen im National in der nationalsozialistischen Ideologie funktioniert hat. Da war das nämlich eher so, dass Afrikaner als aufgehetzte Masse funktioniert dargestellt wurden und Juden als Drahtzieher. Ja, ich habe jetzt hier erstmal ähm, oben so ein bisschen die Funktionsweise in antisemitischen Diskursen darzustellen. Äh, haben wir jetzt auch verschiedentlich in, in der Konferenz schon gehabt, diese Bilder, wo ähm, Juden dargestellt werden mit einer Maske vor dem Gesicht. Das hier ist ein Ausschnitt äh, von einem Kriegspropagandaplakat von 1942 äh, gegen die USA. Nach dem Kriegseintritt der USA hat, haben, hat die Nazi-Propaganda dann da auch versucht, ähm, Juden äh, zu identifizieren und äh, zu zeigen, also die, eine jüdische Einflussnahme zu konstruieren. Und hier sieht man eben äh, äh, US-amerikanische Politiker, die als äh, Juden äh, denunziert werden. Und äh, ja, was ich daran einfach nochmal darstellen wollte, ist diese, diese Entlarvungsrhetorik, äh, dass man eben immer diese, diese ähm, ja, Sozusagen, also es gibt auch viele Vorstellungen, äh, viele, viele Plakate, wo dann ähm, Juden drauf zu sehen sind, äh, Judenstereotype, die hinter einem Vorhang zum Vorschein kommen. Und man hat immer dieses Enthüllungsmoment und immer dieses, dieses Moment, wo sich der Gegner verstellt und seine Identität verbirgt. Das hier ähm, ist jetzt sozusagen in gewisser Weise die koloniale Entsprechung. Das ist äh, schon ein Sonderfall, muss man sagen, dieses, äh, dieses Buch. Ich finde es aber sehr interessant ähm, und habe es auch schon verschiedentlich vorgestellt. Deshalb ähm, hier wird nämlich äh, konkret auf panafrikanische Geheimbünde eingegangen, äh, die als Drahtzieher dargestellt werden. Äh, das ist ein Roman von 1925 von Fritz Oswald Bilse ähm, namens Die Schwarze Welle, Untertitel ist Ein Negerroman. Ähm, 
der Roman ist eine Fälschung äh, und man kann ihn in gewisser Weise, sicherlich nicht in Bezug auf die Verbreitung, aber zumindest vom Grundaufbau mit den Protokollen der Weisen von Zion vergleichen, weil Fritz Bilse behauptet nämlich nicht, er hätte den Roman geschrieben, sondern ein äh, französischer Askari, ein französischer Kolonialsoldat äh, namens Afim Asanga und äh, dieser Kolonialsoldat hätte äh, hätte das Manuskript über Umwege nach Deutschland gebracht, um die Deutschen zu warnen vor einer äh, Verschwörung der Afrikaner in den äh, französischen Kolonien, die darauf abzielt, Europa zu kolonisieren. Ähm, Bilse, muss man dazu sagen, war NSDAP-Mitglied, hat auch in den nationalsozialistischen Monatsheften veröffentlicht, der philosophischen äh, Zeitschrift, äh, von, herausgegeben von Alfred Rosenberg, ähm, und äh, also das Buch ist sicherlich ein, ein Einzelfall in gewisser Weise, aber diese Verschw also ähnliche Verschwörungstheorien finden sich auch vor allem bei Oswald Spengler, der in der Beziehung sehr wichtig war und ähm, dann aber auch äh, bei Alfred Rosenberg. Hier möchte ich noch ein Zitat vorlesen aus dem Buch »Tief und unversöhnlich« hasst der Schwarze uns darum als den Erbfeind seiner Rasse. Wir lassen uns darüber allzu leicht täuschen, weil der Neger ein Schönredner, ein Schmeichler und verschlagener Heuchler ist. Und wir bilden uns ein, dass er den Weißen noch immer für ein übermächtiges, höheres Wesen hält. Und nein, er ist ein gar scharfsinniger Bursche, der Neger. Längst hat er gesehen, wie wir Weißen uns nur mit Mühe in seinem Lande, mit dem mörderischen Klima und den vielen sonstigen Übeln halten, und mit seinem Naturmenschenblick hat er längst erkannt, wie unser Volk in vielerlei Laster verstrickt auf dem Abstieg der Kraft ist. Damit möchte ich übergehen zum zweiten Teil, zu diesem äh, Spezialdiskurs, äh, den ich schon angedeutet habe, über eine äthiopische Gegenkolonisation. 1935 äh, griff Italien Äthiopien an und ähm, viele Wissenschaftler, viele Historiker sagen heute, dass es ein... Äh, eine Art Generalprobe für den Zweiten Weltkrieg war, gerade auch was die rassistische Mobilisierung anbetrifft. Der Krieg wurde als Vergeltungskrieg geführt. Äthiopien war eines der wenigen Länder, was zu diesem Zeitpunkt noch nicht kolonisiert war in Afrika und hatte 1896 in der Schlacht bei Adua gegen Italien gesiegt, was allgemein als Demütigung einer Kolonialmacht gesehen wurde. Und damals gab es schon viele äh, Diskurse um die farbige Gefahr, die jetzt quasi äh, angeregt werde durch diese, diesen äh, Sieg. Und 1936 war eben dann, äh, der, äh, 1935, pardon, ähm, äh, wurde dann sozusagen durch Italien dieser rassistisch aufgeheizte Vergeltungskrieg geführt. Ähm, der Diskurs, also in, es gab einen breiteren deutschsprachigen Diskurs über äh, diesen Krieg ähm, und äh, darin auch immer wieder Verschwörungstheorien, die gesagt haben, dass die Abyssinier jetzt die Kolonialherrschaft umdrehen wollen. Ähm, das hat in Österreich sogar noch mal mehr eine Rolle gespielt als in Deutschland, äh, vermutlich einfach aufgrund der Nähe zu Italien und auch weil das äh, indirekt eine gewisse Rolle gespielt hat in der Südtirol-Frage. Ich habe jetzt hier erstmal ein, äh, ein Sachbuch von Roman Prochatzka, der bis 1934 äh, Konsularrechtsanwalt in Äthiopien gewesen war. Er war Eugeniker, NSDAP-Mitglied und saß nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg sieben Jahre in, in Haft. Ähm, das Buch ist erschienen auf Deutsch, auf Italienisch und auf Englisch und auf Deutsch im Saturn Verlag in Wien. Hier habe ich jetzt zwei Zitate. Von Abyssinien aus soll die neu erstandene äthiopische Bewegung ihren Ausgang nehmen und alle Farbigen in ganz Afrika unter ihre Führung vereinigen. Das ist ziemlich typisch für diesen äh, äh, Diskurs über die äthiopische Weltverschwörung. Ähm, äh, der sitzt auf auf so einer zufälligen etymologischen Verbindung zwischen ähm, dem Äthiopianismus und Äthiopien. Der Äthiopianismus war eine ähm, schwarze Kirchenbewegung in Südafrika gewesen, der so sich entwickelt hat aus so ähm, afrikanischen Aneignungen von, äh, des Missionskristentums und der dann äh, später gewisse Verbindungen hatte mit dem äh, Panafrikanismus in den USA, also vor allem Marcus Garvey. Und ähm, 
die Verschwörungstheoretiker haben jetzt gesagt, äh, der Äthiopianismus äh, wäre quasi der Verschwörer, der, der, die, der Geheimbund Äthiopiens, was völliger Quatsch ist, weil ähm, die Äthiopianisten haben sich nach, nach dem Bibelwort von Äthiopien benannt, was in der Bibel Afrika meint und nicht das Land Äthiopien. Und ähm, ja, das zweite Zitat, ein über die ganze Welt ausgebreitetes Aktionskomitee, dem der eingeborene arabische Bei in Tunis wie der Saxophon blasende Neger in der Berliner Nachbar angehört, sammelt alle Kräfte zum Kampf gegen die weiße Rasse. Hier habe ich noch ein ähm, anderes Cover, weil das ziemlich, äh, das stellt auch nochmal, illustriert nochmal sehr gut diese, diese äh, diese Angstfantasien, die da evoziert werden. Ähm, man sieht hier den äthiopischen Kaiser Haile Selassie, ähm, nicht in seiner üblichen Tracht, normalerweise wird er immer in seinem kaiserlichen Gewand dargestellt. Ähm, hier sieht man ihn quasi in, äh, mit den klassischen Insignien des Kolonialherrn, mit dem Tropenhelm. Und ähm, ja, auch der Untertitel äh, deutet nochmal darauf hin, dass Äthiopien eben äh, noch nicht kolonisiert ist und dass das möglichst bald geschehen soll und äh, ja, aber das Wichtige ist, denke ich, einfach diese Darstellung als Kolonialherren, dass sozusagen, dass die Kolonialherren von morgen sind. Dann möchte ich übergehen zum dritten Teil, ähm, dem Hauptdiskurs sozusagen, ähm, äh, in dem, wie gesagt, Afrikaner als aufgehetzte Masse und Juden als Tazier dargestellt werden. Ähm, äh, ja, generell ist es im Nationalsozialismus so, dass Afrikaner häufig auch als Illustration äh, der rassischen Andersheit des Judentums auftreten. Also man hat ähm, immer, wenn es darum geht, auch weiß ich nicht, in Propagandafilmen wie Der ewige Jude werden dann, äh, werden dann plötzlich äh, eben Bilder von Afrikanern gezeigt oder äh, afrikanische Musik äh, eingeführt, wenn es eben um die Verschiedenheit äh, des Judentums geht. Ähm, ja, das, das Bild von diesem, das Kammer von diesem Buch, die farbige Gefahr, habe ich jetzt hier erstmal genommen, ähm, weil äh, das sozusagen diese, diese Rollenverteilung äh, zuspitzt. Ähm, also man sieht hier einen schwarzen Polizisten, ähm, der auf seinem Helm einen Davidstern hat. Äh, das Foto ist übrigens äh, vermutlich authentisch. Die Polizei in Trinidad hat bis heute den Davidstern auf dem Helm, das hat aber weder religiöse und äh, ganz zu schweigen von politischen Gründen. Das geht einfach auf den Begründer der Polizei zurück, der auch gar, kein, äh, gar keine Verbindung irgendwie zum Judentum hatte. Ähm, aber hier wird das eben benutzt, um so eine Verbindung zu konstruieren, die Schwarzen, die von den Juden gesteuert werden. Ähm, das Buch funktioniert eigentlich ganz anders, aber das lasse ich jetzt mal weg und gehe über zu einem der wichtigsten Werke, der wichtigsten kolonialen Propagandawerke der, Naz der Nazi-Zeit überhaupt, ähm, dem Propagandafilm um Krüger, ähm, der äh, sich um den Burenkrieg dreht. Um Krüger war die, ähm, die paternalistische Bezeichnung des Burenpräsidenten, also des Präsidenten der Transvalrepublik, äh, Paul Krüger, oben heißt Onkel. Und der wurde so ähm, in der deutschen Propaganda seit langem als so eine väterliche Integrationsfigur behandelt. Ähm, es hatte um 1900, also der, äh, der Burenkrieg, ähm, äh, die Buren waren die Nachkommen der niederländischen Erstbesiedlungen am Kap in Südafrika und ähm, die sind äh, um 1900 rum äh, oder gegen Ende des 19. Jahrhunderts in äh, großen Konflikt gekommen mit äh, den Briten, die ähm, dann auch da äh, versucht haben äh, oder Kolonialherrscher waren und ähm, dann gab es eine breite Solidarisierung im deutschsprachigen Raum, äh, die äh, sich äh, mit den Buren verbündet hat gegen die Briten oder solidarisiert hat. Ähm, ein Überbleibsel davon ist die Burenwurst, die es in Wien hier zu kaufen gibt. Um 1900 rum äh, gab es ganz viele Alltagsprodukte, die äh, so zum Kompositum mit diesem Buren äh, Ersatzbestandteil gemacht worden sind. Also es gab Buren Magenbitter, Buren Schnaps, äh, Burenwurst eben und die Burenwurst ist so ein Überbleibsel davon. Ähm, die NS-Propaganda hat es dann aufgegriffen äh, in so einer Art äh, Retrowelle und ähm, hat äh, dann vor allem in der Kriegspropaganda ab 1939 äh, äh, dieses Thema wieder ausgegraben. 
und ähm, Großbritannien als wirklich als antisemitisches Feindbild dargestellt. Ähm, richtungsgebend war da Goebbels ähm, Parole, dass äh, die Briten, die Engländer, die Juden unter den Ariern seien. Und ähm, das sieht man, kann man in diesem Film sehr gut äh, nachvollziehen. Das, was ich jetzt hier äh, illustriere anhand dieses, äh, dieses äh, Stills aus dem Film, ist die Aufhetzung der Schwarzen durch die Engländer. Man sieht hier einen britischen Missionar, der äh, God Save the Queen singt ähm, und Gewehre an äh, Afrikaner verteilt. Also das ist sozusagen das, äh, dieses Urbild der Aufhetzung äh, der Juden oder in diesem Fall äh, der Briten, ähm, äh, also der, die Aufhetzung der Afrikaner durch die Briten. Ja, dann möchte ich äh, einige abschließende Thesen noch aufführen. Ja, das habe ich im Prinzip auch schon alles gesagt. Ähm, naja, man kann auch sagen, die Feindbilder werden zu so einer Art äh, selbsterfüllenden Prophezeiung, frei nach äh, Karl Schmitz, ähm, Losung mit Partisanen kämpft man nur auf Partisanenart. Also es gibt da diese Doppelung, dass ähm, sozusagen die Nazis sich in Konkurrenz setzen mit äh, einem fiktiven Feindbild und äh, sich dann dem immer mehr an, also ihrer eigenen Fiktion immer mehr angleichen, äh, weil sie sozusagen, ähm, das ist eigentlich, äh, findet man überall in der NS-Propaganda, wir müssen es zuerst machen, sonst machen die es zuerst und dann haben wir schon verloren. Also auch dieses Worst-Case-Szenario, das da immer unterliegt, ist ziemlich äh, wichtig. Die präventive Kriegsführung ist natürlich ziemlich wichtig, äh, die äh, dann auch so diesen, diesen Mechanismus hat, wie eine selbsterfüllende Prophezeiung zu wirken, weil ähm, spätestens, wenn ich einen Gegner angreife, dann wird er natürlich wirklich zum Gegner und ähm, dann habe ich sozusagen diese Feindschaft hergestellt, äh, die ich äh, dachte, äh, dass äh, insgeheim immer schon bestehen würde. Und ähm, das radikalste, die radikalste Illustration von dieser ähm, ziemlich verheerenden Dynamik zeigt sich vor allem darin, dass die Nazis häufig das praktizieren, das findet man äh, wirklich sehr häufig in dem Material, genau das praktizieren, was sie den Gegnern vorwerfen. Und da habe ich jetzt auch noch ein Beispiel äh, aus dieser Kriegspropaganda gegen Großbritannien ähm, was auch eine sehr wichtige Rolle spielt, im Übrigen in Ohm Krüger. Das ist ein Buch von 1940 von Kolonialliteraten Fritz Spießer namens Das Konzentrationslager. Und man sollte meinen, es geht hier um die Konzentrationslager des Nationalsozialismus, aber das ist ein Buch über die Internierungslager, die im Burenkrieg eingesetzt wurden. Großbritannien hat Internierungslager eingesetzt in Südafrika, wo die Zivil, also die haben da so eine ver, äh, verbrannte Erde, also diese typisch, typische Dynamik in asymmetrischen Kriegen. Ähm, die Buren äh, geben nach dem Ende des konventionellen Krieges nicht auf, sondern äh, führen weiter Guerillakrieg. Die Briten antworten durch äh, verbrannte Erdepolitik, brennen die Farmen nieder und die äh, Bevölkerung, äh, die Zivilbevölkerung aus den Farmen wird dann in Internierungslager und, um, äh, untergebracht und ähm, dort äh, sterben die häufig an Krankheiten. Und, äh, aber natürlich sind diese Lager, die teilweise auch Concentration Camps genannt wurden, aber die sind nicht äh, mit nationalsozialistischen Lagern vergleichbar wirklich. Die Nazis haben trotzdem behauptet, Großbritannien habe Konzentrationslager erfunden und ich denke, das ist ein ziemlich klares Beispiel dafür, dass die Nazis genau das, was sie ihren Gegnern vorwerfen, eigentlich selber praktizieren. So, dann sind wir am Ende der Zeit und ich danke für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. <lacht>
One, two, three, four, five. Is that okay? Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists, and if I may, a question to Tim Ebner. Uh, from my understanding, uh, some of the images reminded me of the propaganda magazine issued by the Italian fascists, uh, Difesa della Razza. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that, if you've done any comparisons and the like. That's a question. I, you know, I'll leave it to you to, um, to discuss it. I have to say, I, I did not really look at uh, an Italian propaganda. I mean, um, the thing I think was uh, one thing that was really important is the song, uh, Facetta Nera, um, which was really popular in Italy at that time. Um, uh, it was a, yeah, a racist song about uh, Ethiopians and uh, it was used to um, mobilize uh, the Italian society uh, for the war. But, yeah. <laughs> May I? May I? I? Maria Vasiliku from the University of Freiburg. I would like to thank you all for your well thought and well presented papers. I have two questions. One is addressed to Professor Davis. Um, do we have any evidence suggesting the level of visibility of these anti Semitic elitist somehow writings? concerning diffusion of papers, numerical attendance in, in the different lectures given. And the second question appeals, is addressed to all panelists. Um, to the best of my hearing, I didn't hear anything about women and the role of women in all these anti-Semitic writings. Uh, the only female um, element I got was the queen and the other one was the, the picture of this woman. I think it was a woman, right? Behind this fence of this uh, book yeah. mm -hmm. you show. What, is the gender, what role does the gender issue, if at all, play in these anti-Semitic writings? Thank you. Yeah, concerning the question uh, of visibility, I think that is a good question. Um, to what extent were these anti-Semites simply talking to themselves? Uh, and I think in, in, in many cases they were uh, talking to their own readers, to members of, of the movement. Uh, but the, the language that they use, uh, the anti-Semitic terms, the anti-Semitic uh, imagery that they use to discuss uh, colonized peoples and colonized others, you see that as well uh, in the pro-colonial newspapers and the newspapers uh, published by uh, members of the colonial movement, the German colonial society. So whether that's a coincidence or whether that's evidence that the anti-Semitic uh, use of colonial, of anti-Semitic tropes to discuss colonized peoples is influencing uh, wider circles outside the anti-Semitic movement, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but the phenomenon of using anti-Semitic language and images to talk about and to discuss colonized groups during the period of the high imperialism, it went well beyond the anti-Semitic uh, anti movement itself. Uh, concerning the question of, of women, um, that's another good question and another good point. Uh, it is true that, that the empire in Germany was oftentimes talked about in very masculine terms. Uh, when uh, the, the co colonial subjects, whether they're Chinese or Arabs or, or black Africans, are discussed in the anti-Semitic presses and in the colonial presses, pro-colonial presses, uh, they're almost always uh, talking about men and males. Uh, and I think that's because the threat that uh, <coughs> colonized groups allegedly posed to Germany was seen as a particular masculine threat. Um, in my work, I have come across some interesting descriptions of uh, women um, in soldiers' memoirs published after the Herrera War. Uh, during the Herrera War, you do have uh, myths. You've got uh, stories of Herrera women uh, castrating uh, captured German soldiers and blinding captured German soldiers. And this leads uh, to uh, certain discussions of Herrera women uh, in particular in soldiers' memoirs that paint them as kind of like witch-like demonic hags. Uh, but uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, the rhetoric of empire was a masculinized rhetoric and, and the focus was, was typically upon men. 
just, just about this uh, gender question, this um, uh, topic of intermarriage is also something which uh, uh, depends on, on uh, uh, men and women. It's not in the text of Blach so important, but this discussion about mixed marriage in the colonies, you have sometimes the idea that the German woman, uh, the, the Hausfrau, should be going with the colonial officers to avoid uh, mixed racial marriages. And in, in some text, not in this scholarly text from the Colonial Institute, and, and so in some text, um, you have the idea that a German women are helpful to avoid this uh, racial mixture, which should not happen in the view. And therefore, um, you have also uh, the idea that the German woman is part of the colonizing process in this uh, respect. Yeah, I think the, the gender question is really important. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, and the other um, participants also already pointed out the importance of uh, this racial mis miscegenation concept uh, for the whole discourse. And um, yeah, I think um, also for the perspective of the uprising, uh, which is, was established uh, also before the Nazis in the Völkische movement, um, those kinds of alienation theories were really important. Um, so, and of course, uh, uh, the question of racial miscegenation, miscegenation is, uh, is also a question about gender and sexual relations. And um, in the colonial literature, this is like, in the German colonial literature, this is very important from the beginning since the founder of the uh, German colonial literature was a woman, Frida von Bülow. She was really racist and uh, anti-Semitic, and, but she very often addresses uh, those gender problems uh, in the colonies. And um, yeah, and uh, for the Nazi propaganda, um, this gender question also was important, but it was somehow um, secondary since um, women, women simply had to become men. This is uh, the underlining uh, tendency of the um, discussion of the Boer War, like uh, the thing that fascinated um, the Nazis about the Boer War and all those guerrilla and asymmetric wars was the fact that um, they included a total mobilization of the whole society. And um, yeah, therefore also women had to act like men, they had to use the guns. You often have this like images with uh, women with guns and um, it was like, uh, uh, Ernst Jünger said, a total mobilization uh, f uh, that also re reaches as far as to the, the child in the crib, something like that. Thank you very much. The next comment. Yeah, um, I have a question for Christian Davis. Um, yeah, I thought your paper was really great how you said how Jews are represented as colonial subjects, but also colonial subjects being represented as Jews. And particularly interested in the second one, the colonial subjects represented as Jews, because it happens in my research a lot in, when, in the British case of, sort of Indian National Congress being presented as like bourgeois money lenders, that sort of thing. But uh, it seems to me that it's, it serves more of an imperial narrative than it does an anti-Semitic one, whereas the other one is more of an anti-Semitic narrative rather than an imperial one. So I guess my question is, um, do, what, what wider does that represent about wider notions of imperialism? Does it, because in my case, I would say it represents a sort of imperial anxiety. I'm just wondering if you get that sense in the German case during the time period that you're looking at, because for me it happens throughout pretty much the first half of the 20th century, uh, particularly during sort of more de 30s and into decolonization. Just wondering if you get that sense in Germany in sort of the early, very early 20th century, if, if it's anything to do with fear of imperial decline. Fear of imperial decline, I, I, I don't get that sense. Um, I, you know, Germany is, is a rising colonial power, it's a late comer. Um, uh, it doesn't have the, the, the long history of uh, formal colonies like Great Britain has. Um, you know, in, 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 in my reading of, of the sources, um, I've found that uh, 
what's, what's suggested to me is that uh, the anti-Semites who observed the German colonial efforts and were interested in the German colonial efforts uh, tried to make the case to members uh, in the anti-Semitic movement about the alleged dangers posed by colonial subjects by using language and imagery that would be most familiar to the readers of the newspapers, which was the language and, language and imagery of anti-Semitism. Uh, so I don't see it as expressions of fears of imperial decline. I think it's a way to translate uh, the threat that they believe different colonized groups pose to Germans and German interests to translate that using uh, the most familiar language and imagery available to them, which is anti-Semitism. Uh, and you see that explicitly in some of the examples that I cite. The reason why Arabs, the reason why the Chinese are so dangerous is because they have these Jewish attributes and we understand what these Jewish attributes are, so let's use this as a way to talk about the danger that the Chinese and, and the Arabs uh, pose to us. So, oh, I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Um, my asking? question goes to um, Christian Davis and Lucas Borman. Um, for me, it was very convincing the link between um, the colonialist discourse and the racialization or defining the Jews as a race. But it only came up to me the idea that we have the same phenomenon in Vienna, in Karl Eger. He is also the kind of a racialization of the Jewish, so called Jewish question in Vienna, but there are no colonies. So uh, the question is um, whether is this, this kind of what I address now, is this kind of the transfer we addressed in the core for papers, that something comes to Vienna, is simply a transfer from the center to the semi-periphery, or do we have to look for other traces for the racialization of the Jewish question in Vienna? Uh, and the other one is that, uh, it's linking to that, is that we do not have a racialization of the anti-Semitic discourse in Hungary, or hardly anyone. And could be the reason that um, in Hungary we have an inner colonization, that the Jews are used to colonize the periphery in Hungary. Um, should, should I answer? Yes, please. Was it? Yes. Um, for me, it's most important that you have in, in, in the German context such a great admiration to scholarship. And this racialization is not only a topic of some crazy people from an anti-Semitic margin, but is um, get its importance by the scholarship done by universities and especially these colonial institutes. I think for the German mentality of this time, 1880 to, to 1920, it was most important to have this scientific narrative as a foundation. And this is quite different in other cultures. You have not this nearly unbelievable uh, um, uh, expectations in, in scholarship which you have in these times and even, even the Nazis tried um, to base their ideas on, on scholarship. And this colonial institute is very interesting if you go in details, especially about Eugen Fischer, he produces uh, results that clearly shows you that mixed marriage is not a problem for health and nothing else. Um, but he, he um, had these results very clearly in, in the scholarship, but turned it upside down and uh, had um, in a, a political um, um, outcome which is racial against his own findings, this mixed populations which he, um, um, on, on which he made research are healthy people and have no problems, but he points to, to the uh, idea that there is something problematic on this and this was an outcome seen as his scholarship and you have a lot of contradictions and for me it's quite interesting uh, to see that you have a, a scholarship who had this contradiction of, um, of um, in itself 
And I think this is something special about the situation in, in, in Germany. Um, and it's not so much the colonial enterprise, but the idea to be scholarly and scientific in all what is done by the German Empire. And I would say that the question of uh, the degree to which German nationalists and, and German anti-Semites in uh, Austria uh, and in Vienna, <clears throat> the degree to which they uh, paid attention to what was happening in the German colonies is, is, is for me, an, an open question. I don't know the answer to that. And I think that's something that, that needs to be examined. Um, Certainly, uh, racial theorists, Viennese and Austrian racial theorists, uh, talked about in their work uh, <clears throat> races beyond European boundaries and talked about uh, Africans and, and, and Asians. Uh, but a, a, a systematic study of the extent to which colonial imaginings and uh, uh, the degree to which uh, Austrian anti-Semites and Austrian German nationalists uh, were part of this larger German world that was oriented to, uh, to Africa and to Asia uh, and uh, paid a lot of attention to what was happening uh, in the German colonies in particular. I think that needs further study and more examination. Okay, thank you very much. We have three more speakers who are registered right now, and I have the feeling that our time will be up, uh, the available time, so please be as brief as possible. Uh, you are the next. Okay, thank you. Uh, short warning, uh, I'm a sociologist, so I may suffer from some professional deformation. And uh, uh, moreover, sort of like I'm a sociologist of knowledge, and I'm interested uh, in, in, in knowledge formation, I mean, I learned a lot from your papers, but I couldn't help thinking all the time uh, the question, what drives research like this? What, what motivates people to delve so deeply into uh, racist and anti-Semitic uh, discourse? And what, why do you do this, for one reason? What do you expect from your readers and from your audience? I mean, we can be duly betroffen, and I think this is probably part of the, the result. Uh, racist, uh, racism is racist, and uh, anti-Semites are anti-Semitic. I mean, this is clear, so we all feel that, that we are betroffen. But what is it you want? Do you want your readers to understand and fight it? You want your readers to feel that the world is a bad place and we should be better for it. I, I'm not sure exactly um, why I was listening uh, to, these, to these papers, and what I got away from it is really that uh, anti-Semites are anti-Semitic and racists, uh, that racism is racist, and there's a connection between the two. But I'm sure you want more than just like a deep historical understanding of this. What is the point of a deep historical understanding? That's my question. Whoever wants to answer. I, I understand there's a, somebody want to comment on the question. Yeah. So that gives you time to answer this fundamental issue. You want to comment on, on his... Yes, please. Uh, Tomasz Kender from the next panel. And let me connect the, the last com let, let me comment the last comment and uh, let me comment Professor Borman's lecture. Uh, I, I wouldn't put any questions, but I will bring up a small philological addenda, which is as much useful as any other useless philological addendas. So, and this addenda relates no, not so much the colonialism and anti-Semitism, but it relates the, the orientalism and philosemitism. So, Hermann Strack, the celebrated Lutheran theologian, Fighting anti-Semitism and the anti-Jewish blood libel in his huge book acknowledges that while the anti-Jewish blood libel is a theological nonsense, the ritual murder as a right has been exercised even at the end of the 19th century by Hermann Strack. And in his opinion, this, exercise, this uh, ritual murder has been exercised by primitive non-Jewish tribes. <clears throat> to prove this statement, he brought up the famous Stari Multan case from the mid-1980s, 
Russia, Vyatka Gubernia, in which Finno Ugurian Wotjaks Udmuts have been accused with committing ritual murder. For Hermann Strack, the ritual murder as a right among primitive peoples was unquestioned, just as was uh, unquestioned the impossibility of the Jewish ritual murder. Thank you. Mm. Maybe we take the last question uh, already now, and you comment then on everything you want to comment. I'll try and keep it as short and as pain, painless as possible. So for Chris, it's a quick question. You talked about it as a European phenomena, this kind of colonial uh, and internal anti-Semitism. How does Germany compare to the other um, imperial powers, like Britain, like France? Is Germany more extreme? Are there more of them? Is it more of an outlier? And, related, and picking up on Bella's point about sort of transnationalism and transfer, where are they getting, you know, are they reading one another? Are German anti-Semites reading French anti-Semites and French racists, or are they all just doing their own thing and it's just kind of appearing out of an internal ether? Okay, thank you very much. Um, if that is okay with you, we close the debate and the question and answers now and allow every one of the three panelists to comment and that would also sum up our panel for this morning. So I don't know in which, would you want to start? I would like to answer to the first question. Well, I think um, it's really important to, um, to research those mindsets um, used on the national socialism because um, yeah, I mean, I think we all agree on the fact that it never should happen again, and um, you have to know your enemy, and um, yeah, you, you have to know how, how um, the Nazis did it uh, to popularize such uh, stupid concepts, and this is exactly why I choose this kind of uncanny approach, not to look at national socialism in an exotic way, like um, looking at it and finding all the stupid details um, in their racial theories, which um, from from uh, today's uh, today's um, standpoint look really ridiculous. I wanted to look at it in a way um, which relates to to the present, which is exactly this like uh, conspiracy theories and this paranoia element and um, yeah, the combination of ideology and uh, popular culture. And I think this is what made the, the Nazi ideology, despite its fact that, uh, that in uh, a lot of uh, perspectives it's really absurd, um, still very popular. Thank you. Ja, also ich würde jetzt gerne auf äh, Deutsch antworten. Äh, zunächst mal, es war ein historischer Beitrag und da ist es dann selbstverständlich, dass manche soziologische Frage unbeantwortet bleibt. Nichtsdestotrotz ist für mich eben dieser Punkt wichtig und mein Thema war ja nicht mit antisemitischen politischen Aktivisten, sondern mit der hochstehenden Wissenschaftskultur des Deutschen Kaiserreichs. Es sind hervorragende Forscher und ganze Disziplinen aus diesen Kolonialinstituten hervorgegangen. Islamwissenschaft, Anthropologie, Völkerkunde, dieser Bereich, auch persische Sprachwissenschaft, dieser Bereich ist durch die Kolonialinstitute gefördert worden. Und das, was unter dem soziologischen Gesichtspunkt interessant ist, die Attraktivität dieser Gedankenwelt wird durch das Label Wissenschaft transportiert und in meinem Beispiel so attraktiv, dass selbst ein selbstbewusster äh, jüdischer Deutscher, der Erfolg haben möchte in der deutschen Gesellschaft, diese Gedank, dieses Gedankengut aufgreift. Ne? Das ist auch in den Büchern von Sula mit Wolkow ja auch reflektiert, dass die der Antisemitismus als kultureller Code teilweise auch kleine Teile, Randgruppen innerhalb des Judentums erreicht und in diesem besonderen Fall eben dadurch besonders attraktiv wird, dass er so ein wissenschaftliches Label bekommt. Und der Antisemitismus selber hat sich ja dann auch so genannt, um so einen wissenschaftlichen Anschein zu erwecken. Das haben Sie schon bei Wilhelm Ma. Also diese Wissenschaftlichkeit des Antisemitismus ist eine Linie, die ich für wichtig halte und deswegen 
befasse ich mich mit dem Thema noch dazu, weil viele Theologen ähm, auf dieser Schiene dann partizipiert haben, anders als Stöcker, haben eben Neutestamentler insbesondere von 1920 bis 1945 als Spezialisten der Judentumskunde sich eben an äh, dem antisemitischen Aktivismus auch beteiligt. Und das ist für mich der Zusammenhang, ne? die, die Wissenschaftlichkeit einer menschenfeindlichen Weltanschauung führt dazu, dass sie eine gewisse Attraktivität bekommt, die sie speziell in Deutschland nicht bekommen würde, wenn sie nicht auch noch den Eindruck der Wissenschaftlichkeit ähm, erweckt. And, and I know we're out of time, so I'll just say something very quickly in response to the first question, uh, goals that I have for my readers and for my audience. And I think it's the same that I have for uh, students in the history courses that I teach, and that is uh, to, to guide students to an understanding of past mentalities, right? To understand uh, how past people made sense of the world around them and how that, the way in which they make sense, made sense of the world around them differs from our perspectives today. And in my work, uh, Uh, I examine how anti-Semitism uh, provided uh, a framework, a perspective uh, with which many people uh, made sense of the world around them. And we've seen that this was not simply exclusive to Germany uh, in the panels presented yesterday and also today, but that this also was a framework that people uh, inside Germany and outside Germany used uh, to interpret their surroundings and to interpret the world around them. So uh, comprehending mentalities. I think is something that I want uh, my readers to, to come away with an understanding of. So, möchte ich mich herzlich bei den drei Kollegen am Podium bedanken, uh, im Publikum für die aktive Teilnahme, waren viele Fragen, ich glaube es hätte noch mehr gegeben, entschuldige mich, dass wir jetzt abbrechen müssen, ich wünsche Ihnen alle noch jetzt einmal eine erholsame Pause und dann noch eine spannende Konferenz.